I would just now really like to welcome um, Dr. Paula McFadden, Dr. Susan McCrory and Dr. Rachel Naylor from Ulster University. And they are going to share with us, I suppose they're going to give us an overview of the wellbeing findings relating to social work from May 20 to January 23. So welcome ladies, I'm going to stop sharing now and let Paula put the slides up for you to share. Thank you. So yes, so the presentation that we're going to do today is going to specifically hone in on social worker well-being and quality of work and life and coping during COVID. Uh, the study did start very quickly after the onset of COVID um, uh, with some seed funding support from NISC and from the Southern Trust and then subsequently we were funded by the PHA uh, R&D office for five further uh, data collection points. So I just introduced myself, Paula McFadden from Ulster University, my colleague Susan McGrory and Rachel Naylor, also, also from Ulster. Um, I just want to also give a mention to the wider research team. So you can see there was a a number of us um, involved in the study and it really was a team approach so I want to give mention to everybody that was involved. The study was mixed methods so we have statistical skills as well as qualitative analysis skills on the wider team um, and over the course of the study we've had uh, a few excellent research assistants uh, working with us and uh, the latest of which is Justin McLaughlin, um, and I hope, I think Justin is with us. So just that uh, call out to everybody that was involved. The study was three years long, and um, it was across all the countries um, uh, of the UK. So it was an extensive piece of work. So the aims of this session is to provide an overview of the wellbeing findings relating to social work, from uh, May 2020 to January 23. Um, so, you know, you can imagine um, the detail that we have on all of these findings. So we've kind of handpicked the, the most important points that we feel we need to make in this presentation today. Um, we do have a website and we'll share that on our final slide. So if you're interested in looking at our publications and reports, and infographics, um, there's, they're all there as well. So what do we do? We um, had six phases, you can see the dates there. Uh, we aimed from the outset to examine a, about working during the pandemic. And at this stage, we know we're meant to be in the post pandemic era, and we know that there's legacy issues. Um, and there's been prolonged effects on the well-being of the workforce. Our study was on um, health and social care workers. So we looked at nursing, midwifery, allied health professions, social workers and social care workers. So we had a number, as you can imagine, of disciplines um, that we were able to give analysis on and we were able to feed that back and the, on request to the various uh, professional leads and employers whenever they look for uh, presentations. And we're still willing to do that um, and, and ensure that the, the findings that we have will help to inform interventions and wellbeing approaches for the staff. But today we're going to look at the social work specific um findings right and to talk to you a wee bit about how we measured well-being and everything uh, for mental well-being we use the short work edinburgh well-being scale at seven questions with a total score of 35 right and the higher the score the better the well-being uh, this measure is used in other public health surveys so it's a useful one to compare you know, to the wider literature in terms of what's considered normative well-being using the scale. We also used uh, the work-related quality of life scale, and that was one that covered a range of different organizational and work-related quality of life measures. 
to give us a sense of uh, what was going on for the workforce. We used from phase two onwards, we used um, a burnout measure. We looked at the, we used the Copenhagen burnout inventory, which looks at burnout in personal life, burnout in work life, and burnout relation, in relation to service users. So we thought this was a really important one because it gave that breakdown, because as we all can remember well, not only did our work life change, but so did our lives in general. Um, so it sort of broke down those areas of burnout that was, you know, very useful for the time. We didn't use a burnout scale in the first phase, and that was um, because we were initially just looking at well-being, coping and quality of work and life. But because of the analysis of the first phase, what we found was burnout was coming through and we felt then from then on we needed to get a measure of that. So that's why it was only introduced from phase two on. We also used ways of coping and standardized scales for that. So we used the brief cope and the clerk uh, coping with work and stress, uh, a family stressor scale again, trying to get that break down the differentiation between the kind of um, personal and work life coping. In addition to these um, standardized scales, we asked qualitative questions and we focused those according to what the needs of that specific time was. And we were informed by those, by you know the previous entries, by participants, what people were saying the main issues were. So we were able to hone in in qualitative detail to what people were telling us. Um, and again, additionally, we had 18 focus groups throughout the three years of the study, and they were with frontline workers, managers, and human resource professionals. So I'll just move on now to the next. So just to tell you a little bit about, um, you know, the participation levels. In England, overall, across the six phases, we had 1,575 participants. Scotland, a lot smaller, 308. Wales, 576. And Northern Ireland, 1881. Uh, total participants of social workers across all the phases Therefore, it was 4,340. When we look at the total responses across the full study for all the groups, we have responses from 14,400 uh, participants across all the phases. So we have quite a substantial evidence base generated from this study. Um, so the demographics, just to talk a little bit about you know, the characteristics um, of the demographics and the final phase. And these are, you know, quite typical across all the phases we found. Um, so in total, social workers participated in the sixth phase was 406. They were majority female, you can see, um, 63, or sorry, 83.3%. Nearly a third were in the age bands between 40 and 49. 71% um, worked in the community, 54% worked in trust, you know, statutory social work um, or in local authorities, 41% worked with children, 53% had between 11 and 30 years of experience, 34% um, were line managers, and 48% thought about changing their employer, right? So we asked these questions as we moved through the various phases because we could see there was lots of references they wanting to leave. Um, so we thought we'd better measure this. And so 36% thought about changing their occupation. So that's over a third um, of those that responded had said that. We asked a question in the final phase about um, safe staff um, to service user ratios. Um, and nearly 65% felt that they weren't operating within those ratios. Now, there's an extensive piece of work going on regionally um, on this at the moment um, that we're involved in as well as a research team. 
Um, and so we would encourage people to participate in interviews and focus groups across all the trusts um, so as that we can get an evidence base on this. Um, and it's important because there's going to be policy developments in this area and also legislation into the future. So just to give you, you know, if I was to sum up, you know, what to be found, we found that well-being and burnout are like a line of continuum. Um, you know, what we also found that they're like a seesaw. Um, so if your well-being is high, burnout is low. If burnout is high, well-being is low. And you would say, you know, anecdotally, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, do you really need all those uh, responses, you know, to be able to make that conclusion? And you would be right in saying so. But what we have now that we didn't have beyond the anecdotal is the evidence base and the statistical support um, for, for these findings. So um, importantly, I'm just going to take you through just some slides that give you a, a little bit of this, a wee bit more of this. Um, so mental well-being, UK, UK wide big country. And I explained before about the short work Edinburgh Wellbeing Scale, a score of 23.6 um, would be considered the normative level of well-being in the general population. So what we consistently found across all the phases um, for social workers was that we were two and sometimes three points below at least the well-being um, uh, levels that would be considered normative. We also found that well-being tended to fall as the phases you know, progressed with better well-being, typically in the very first phase. So if you remember back to the phase where everybody was in the doorsteps on a Thursday night clapping for carers and, you know, that feeling of solidarity um, as a global community, you know, just bewildered by this new phenomena that had hit us. Um, there seemed to be a type of euphoria that came with that, where workers were feeling useful and purposeful. But as the time went on, well-being suffered um, and people you know, were really quite str struggling um, with their mental well-being. And that, that we have evidenced in, in various ways. I think there's somebody where I might go. Oh, thank you. Um, the quality of working life uh, similarly fell, you know, from the first phase um, across all the phases. And you can see there, if we look at Northern Ireland, ours has fallen um, there at the sixth phase as well. And this is for social work. You can see there phase three. If I take you through what those phases actually mean. Phase one was, um, you know, there the first summer of the pandemic. So you're talking about May to July of 2020. Phase two was November until January, February time, uh, 21. See that phase three, how low it is there in Northern Ireland and across all of the countries. Um, that was, do you remember the lockdown Christmas? Um, that was quite difficult for everybody. And um, it was evidenced in our data as well that it was a particularly difficult time for the workforce. And so then you can see then by summer of uh, 21 he, that it had increased slightly again and it, it sort of leveled out. And the final phase, as I say, you know, the well-being had fallen again. So, so typically we can see, you know, the trends and the similarities and the differences across the countries there in terms of quality of work and life. So burnout, this is an interesting slide. Um, I just put up there the, the cutoffs to try and explain this because if people score zero to 49 using this burnout scale, it's considered low burnout, okay? Uh, 50 to 74 would be considered moderate um, levels of burnout and high would be 75 and above, right? So what we typically found was that 
Uh, we were scoring mainly in the moderate levels here in relation to personal and work related burnout. Still concerning, you know, because this impacts on people's well being to be expressing even moderate levels of burnout. Um, client related burnout remained low, okay, throughout all the phases. Now, what we found in the qualitative evidence was, you know, the workforce were concerned and compassionate, maintained concern and compassion for the service users. And that's what this client related burnout relates to, how you feel about your work with people. Now, we can see here in phase six that that level of client related burnout did increase a bit. And that is concerning, even although it's still low. Um, it just means that over time with burnout increasing, there's a risk of uh, client related energy or client related work, uh, getting burnout expressions in relation to that as well. So what we also find, and I'll just say this as an aside, um, whenever we looked at those that scored, now remember these are all average levels of burnout, okay? So those that would have scored away up in the high levels of burnout were the people that were saying they were intending to leave the profession. Now this one has lots of bars on it, right? But I'm gonna summarize it. Um, across all the phases, positive ways of coping, such as you know their your active coping planning positive reframe and acceptance and the use of uh, emotional support and instrumental support they tended to be the more frequently used types of coping than negative ways of coping such as substance use behavioral disengagement and self-blame so they were the higher the most frequently ways of coping however over the phases the positive ways of coping were decreasing and negative ways of coping were increasing. So again, this is more kind of insights into what happens longer term, you know, if people are struggling with well-being um, and levels of burnout. So um, I think that's an important, an important message in this as well. Okay. So we asked if employer supports were taken to support wellbeing, and if not, why not? And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Susan, who is going to take us through the next number of slides. Susan, are you okay to take over? Yeah, thanks, Paula. And I, I, you tell me, do you want me to move on to the next slide now? Yeah, I can do, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so as, as Paula explained, we asked people whether they'd taken up any of the employer supports that have been offered to help to manage their well-being. And you can see there overall, um, if we look at the UK wide figures, um, that only 30% of people UK wide in phase six were actually taking up any of the employer support. We found that Northern Ireland were actually the most likely country for people to actually make use of the employer support. And we found here that Scotland were the least likely on only 21%. Okay, Paula. Yeah, yeah. We also asked them the reasons for why they'd not been taking up support. And you can see here, there's a, there's a variety of reasons. Um, some people didn't feel they needed support at all. And um, you can see the figures are relatively similar in general, but in um, in Wales, they're particularly high number of people there. 40% didn't feel they needed any, any employer support at all. Um, so whereas you can see in Northern Ireland, actually this, they, they were the lowest. So people in Northern Ireland, it suggests that they do feel that they need support. Some people had received support elsewhere and that could be their family or friends or uh, other techniques they use to support. There were quite a high number, particularly in Wales, that found that the support that was offered was either maybe not very accessible or it was maybe at inconvenient times and, and therefore hard to attend. And then we can see there were quite a few 
other reasons. Thanks, Paula. Yeah. yeah. So we looked at the association between burnout, well-being, and quality of work and life, and we measured whether there was any association between whether respondents had considered leaving their occupation and how this consideration of leaving the profession actually relates to their burnout score. And you can see here that, um, as Paula explained earlier, the client related level of burnout ha has remained low across, across the phases. But the difference we can see here is in the personal burnout, those people who were considering leaving the profession and therefore answered yes, so the pink, the pink bars, we can see that their level of burnout is actually high. Whereas the people who answered no, the, the burnout is moderate. And, and again, we found this the same sort of thing with the work-related burnout, that um, the people who are considering leaving have high levels of work-related burnout. And the people who say they're not considering changing profession at the minute, even they have moderate levels of burnout. So the burnout rates overall are definitely a significant concern. We can also see there that in relation to the client related burnout, those people who are saying, yes, they are considering leaving the profession or changing occupation have scores over 40. And whilst, you know, as Paula said earlier, these are still considered low, in this group of people, they are edging towards the moderate level of burnout. So suggesting that that, um, or given that concern, that if this pattern was to continue, that it may start affecting the way people are working with their service users. So we also looked at the effects of the pandemic on services and right across the six phases, we asked people to put themselves in one of these categories. The first one was that they were not impacted by COVID-19 pressures and maybe in the early part of the pandemic services were even stepped down completely. The second group was those that were impacted, but not significantly. And the final group were those who felt they were overwhelmed by increased pressures. And you can see the figures really speak for themselves here. The numbers that were not impacted by COVID-19, even in phase six, it is really tiny, 2.2% overall for the UK um, and something similar for Northern Ireland. England has the highest number here, but even there it's less than 5%. By far the, the, the most, the highest figure is those that feel overwhelmed by increased pressures. And overall in the UK, we can see that 61% of people feel overwhelmed by increased pressures. And in England, it's almost 70%. Northern Ireland actually had the lowest figure here, but we can still see that it's over half of people feel overwhelmed by increased pressures. and. 43.7% do feel they're being impacted. The other thing that we found is that you know, with the increased amount of impact on services, so those who are overwhelmed by increased pressures, that their well-being and their quality of work and life decreased significantly, and the level of burnout increased significantly, which, as Paula said earlier, is it's possibly not that surprising, but again, you know, it's giving us that evidence base to show that this is the case. So as Paula said, in phase six, we added a new question that hadn't been asked before. And we asked people, do you believe your service operates a safe staff to service user ratio? 35.3% um, of social workers felt yes that safe staffing, their levels were safe. However, worryingly, 64.7% of social workers answered no, that they didn't feel that levels of staffing were safe in ratio with service users. Again, we explored whether staff perceptions of safe staffing 
were linked with burnout. And again, we found that those who felt staffing levels were not safe, um, the people answering no, so the lilac or purple bars in, in this graph, these people had significantly higher levels of burnout in relation both to personal burnout, work-related burnout, and again, client-related burnout. And, and you know, most of these were in the moderate level of burnout. So in um, is this is Rachel? Rachel, is this for you to take over? The, yeah. Yes, yes, I'll be happy to take mm -hmm. over now. Um, Thanks. Thank you. So I'm just going to sum up the key findings from phase six and a lot of the data that's been spoken to um, just now by Susan supports these key findings. So in terms of thinking about um, the area of support and um, where do practitioners find support? Um, overall, um, the key area where people found support was from their peers um, at work, from managers and the in-person wellbeing supports that were offered. So um, Susan gave us data which um, supports that, uh, that was on the previous slide. You're muted, Rachel. Th sorry, um, thinking about um, the intention expressed by some of the participants to leave their occupation. And we can see that over a third of social workers UK wide, um, that's 36.2%, had also considered changing their occupation. With the highest proportion of those being in England, though, at 44.2%, but closely followed by the proportion in Northern Ireland, um, which is 36.2% and lower proportions in Scotland and Wales. So they, these are really significant proportions, I think um, very important um, data um, to support this here. Throughout the six phases of study, um, social workers indicated that support from managers, 39.5% um, of respondents said that, um, a pay increase, 37.8% um, of, of respondents said that, well-being support um, and safer working conditions would change their minds about wanting to leave their employer or current occupation. So these four key areas are very significant in terms of our thinking um, about how to support social workers um, so that we don't get those very dangerous levels of attrition, um, which are potentially on the horizon. Thinking then um, overall about the impact on service users, which is obviously key as well, um, we can see that in relation to children's services, first of all, we had some um, important qualitative responses reflecting on this, and I'm just quoting a couple here. Um, a social work manager in Northern Ireland um, said um, in response to our survey that at one point there was one social worker over 70 children. So you can see that, you know, impact on children uh, that would stem from that would be really significant and um, that very, very poor um, staffing ratio. Um, another quotation speaks to this area as well. Um, staff shortages leading to unsafe staffing levels and staffing ratios outside of care plans. They were, they were a feature and this is really important um, data to take into account. And as um, Paula mentioned before, we'll feed through um, into current and ongoing work um, in relation to safe staffing levels in Northern Ireland. So that was um, just a flavour of some of the impact and serious impact on children's services. Um, in terms of the impact on older people's services, um, we have a quotation here from another participant in the survey um, from hospital work in Northern Ireland. Um, and he said, older people's services seem to keep cutting the services we can offer. Caseloads are getting bigger every week and there is such a shortage of carers. It is impossible to do the job properly and meet clients' assessed needs. So again, this indicates extremely significant impacts on our um, older service users in Northern Ireland. 
And also another quotation from Northern Ireland speaks to this. So um, a female practitioner who works within the community setting said, they, um, speaking of um, older people, report feeling scared, forgotten, unimportant, marginalized, and victims of ageist practices. And again, that you know, um, summary of very intense and difficult feelings, um, which um, are related to these um, poor um, staffing levels, you know, say a lot um, in the, those few words about the, the impact on service users. And staying with thinking about the impact um, on older people, um, a final quotation um, from a female worker in Northern Ireland. Um, he says that service demand has increased with increased pressure on individual social workers. Domiciliary care crisis has had a massive impact upon service delivery. Social workers are receiving abuse from clients and families who are frustrated because of a lack of resources for their families. And of course the impacts um, of lockdown and poor health which directly result from COVID-19 happened you know uh, uh, an impact on this area but um, you know service demand needs to be met and the pressures that are um, described here the crisis that's described here leading to a situation where families you know who wouldn't normally do this um, are so frustrated that um, they are venting towards um, professionals is a really serious issue. Um, so it is again um, an area that we really need to, to consider seriously. So finally, I just wanted to talk about the good practice recommendations. There are many recommendations that arise from this study, and this is a summary of the key recommendations. So firstly, it's recommended that employers should offer more flexibility around working hours and location, including working from home if possible. Um, and this may be a factor which could um, increase the stability of the workforce, reduce attrition um, in the workforce. Um, we need to think more about safe staffing levels um, and as we were saying before, ongoing research um, is taking place in relation to this. Um, we might include workload waiting models here. Um, so safe, safe staffing levels essentially need to be adhered to or developed if they're not already present, um, which is a, a, a key point to make um, given the findings from phase six. We're feeling that these safe staffing levels are not already present um, in many locations. Thirdly, um, training is needed in relation to where redeployment is necessary um, and where skill acquisition, new skill acquisition is necessary um, in cases where perhaps staff need to perform multiple or new roles um, in the usual practice periods and very importantly in preparation for future crises or pandemics. Um, and we can't rule that out at all. And if you look at, you know, the latest announcements from the World Health Organization, they're really concerned that there isn't that level of future preparedness, um, which is needed globally. And that's also true locally. Um, a further recommendation then um, is that social support for colleagues and in connection with colleagues and managers should be nurtured and made part of organizational policy and practice. As we've seen, um, social support is key um, for supporting um, the resilience and the well-being of um, practitioners and um, preventing burnout. Uh, a further recommendation then is that employers should support staff to take breaks and holidays and many employees reported um, in the surveys that they were not taking breaks anymore, they were not taking holidays anymore, just um, because of the, 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 the crisis in staffing, the need to support their clients. Um, and that, you know, there is um, that um, necessity for taking breaks and holidays, otherwise um, that could have big impacts in terms of resilience and levels of burnout as well. Um, frontline managers also need support. Um, and this is something that clearly came out in the research um, and they need to be supported so that they in turn can offer support 
um, to individuals and team members um, whom they manage. And finally, um, the recommendation that's um, really important as well is that we need to refocus on staff wellbeing culture and the climate. Um, and we're, we're thinking here that just like in very good social work, early intervention and prevention um, of um, drops in resilience, of poor well-being, of, of burnout, um, are the most effective ways um, to, to, to tackle these issues. Thank you, Rachel. And, you know, just a thank you to everybody that participated in the study over the three years. Like, without your voice and taking the time to complete a survey, we wouldn't be able to share these results with you and put them together, you know, in a coherent form. So thank you, everybody that participated. And please do stay with us for the safe staffing research that we're now leading on. That is uh, our website. If you just went online and just put on health and social care workforce study, uh, this tends to pop up first. Um, but that there is the website for it. Um, that's my email address if there's any specific questions afterwards. Thanks to Susan and Rachel for um, helping with the presentation today. I appreciated that too. Um, and thank you, Alison. Thanking you all as well. Um, it was very interesting. They're always very interesting to hear the outcomes of the studies. Um, and thank you to everybody who came. I would just now really like to